analysis talk, but that saves substantive questions towards the end just to protect the flow um, and to make sure that she doesn't get stuck on the first five minutes of the talk, which can sometimes happen if we all start jumping in because I'm sure it will be quite provocative. So with that, um, Alice, it's a pleasure to have you here. Please take it away. Great, thank you so much, Deirdre. And thanks again to the organizers as well for the invitation to join today's session. So let me just quickly share my screen. Can folks see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay, great, awesome. So. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Alice Shang and I'm the global head of AI ethics at Sony. So I lead our research lab on AI ethics and also our team that conducts AI ethics assessments. And today I'll be speaking on algorithmic fairness and interpretability. And specifically um, um, I'll be presenting two works in progress. One is on causal fairness and the other is on um, diversity metrics for human image data sets. So let's go ahead and start with the first paper, which is Promises and Challenges of Causality for Ethical Machine Learning. This is joint work with Ida um, Ramatulabi, who is also in the audience today. And Ida um, is a new research scientist on my team and also was one of our interns last summer. And basically in this paper, we take a potential outcomes framework approach to causal fairness and talk about some of the advantages and also some of the shortcomings of this sort of approach. And so first, just to set the context. Um, so typically when we're thinking about the machine learning context, we're thinking mostly about prediction and trying to develop the best predictors. And this doesn't necessarily always require um, consideration of the underlying causal mechanisms in our data sets. Um, that said, now that we're in a state where uh, machine learning is increasingly being used, not just for predictive purposes, but also to guide decision-making, um, we have to think a bit more about um, the fact that historical data can be subject to discrimination and can reflect historical discriminatory trends, and that such trends often um, operate in a very multi-layered, multi-stage way. And so within this context, it's quite important that we actually identify and delineate different sources of discrimination in order to mitigate unfairness in our models. And so just as a brief overview of some existing approaches to fairness, so we can roughly divide them into statistical or observational criteria and um, causal criteria. And so observational criteria in this case um, rely exclusively on observed data distributions, whereas causal criteria also rely on counterfactual outcomes. And there are some pros and cons to these different approaches. So um, on the observational side of things, of course, the, the main challenge, which is what we want to tackle um, in this paper is identifying different sources of disparities is quite difficult with observational criteria. Um, and there's also challenges in terms of conflicting definitions. And um, in particular, there's very famously impossibility um, theorems in this context where many popular statistical notions of fairness cannot simultaneously be achieved um, under certain um, assumptions. And then um, on the flip side though, the advantage of such observational criteria is because they only rely on the observed data distribution, they can be quite easy and straightforward to evaluate. Um, in contrast with the causal criteria, because counterfactual outcomes are not directly observed, we do need to make strong assumptions in order to impute such counterfactual outcomes. And in addition, when we're talking about the algorithmic fairness context, in order to actually create counterfactual outcomes, we need to think very carefully about manipulation of immutable characteristics um, like race, gender, age, that are often the, um, the attributes that we're interested in from a discriminatory perspective. Um, of course, the whole purpose, though, of going through all this is our hope is that um, even um, given these challenges, um, we are able to use these types of causal criteria to identify sources of disparity. 
And so the contributions of this um, work are first to shift um, some of the focus from intervening on the immutable attributes themselves to the perception of these immutable attributes. And this is already something that is done in the social science context. Um, Greiner and Rubin famously proposed this in terms of evaluating discrimination um, in the non-algorithmic context. And in particular, this also shifts a lot of the focus in terms of being very precise in defining the timing and nature of the manipulation of the perception of the, um, of the sensitive attribute. And so um, by defining how you're actually changing that perception, that in turn can affect the type of causal effect you're actually able to estimate. And also in the process of determining the timing of that intervention, that also determines what sorts of discriminatory actors um, effects you can actually um, measure. And so this is quite important um, insofar as we might be wanting to pinpoint the precise source of bias. Um, we also propose based on this approaches for unfairness evaluation and mitigation. And we also introduce some causal variants of common statistical criteria and show that there's no fundamental incompatibility between them, unlike in the case for statistical criteria. Um, and so in terms of um, illustrating this a bit, and um, I won't be able to go through all of the points in this paper, unfortunately, today, because we also have the other paper to go over. But um, first, just to start with a toy example to build some intuition. Um, so let's say we have um, some sort of hiring process, and at a certain point, we have the perception of the applicant's gender. Um, and this is what we would like to manipulate in order to say if this person were perceived to be a different gender, would they have had the same hiring decision? And mapping this out on a timeline is quite important because um, we want to distinguish between covariates X that are determined before the perception of gender versus um, X tilde of A um, and Y of A, which are things that happen after the perception of gender and thus are a function of them. And so let's say that the gender is perceived at the point of the interview process. In that case, we have to consider um, interview score to be a post-treatment variable. And if we want to um, consider that in, um, in estimating any causal effect, we have to very specifically model the relationship between A and um, X tilde. Um, in contrast, if instead we are not trying to include discrimination that might be from the interview itself, but instead we want to measure the effect of discrimination after the interview process, then we can consider X tilde to be a pretreatment variable, and thus um, we can actually use that information more directly. Um, and so in terms of um, what kind of um, unfairness evaluation we might do in this context, so from a causal perspective, what we're interested in is the expected difference between people's potential outcomes if their attribute was different. And so you can say um, causal parity then is um, implies that a decision-making process is fair if this expected difference is zero. Um, of course, in order to do any causal inference in this context, to actually impute the other potential outcome that we don't observe, there are some um, pretty strong assumptions that sometimes um, that we must make. Um, what I mean is they are sometimes very strong assumptions. And this is important to map out because oftentimes in papers, people will just um, sort of say these are the assumptions and that that is a caveat. But if we want to actually use this um, sort of methodology for, um, for making inferences about fairness, we need to be quite rigorous in terms of actually evaluating whether these assumptions hold in a particular case. Um, so these assumptions are, um, first off, SUTFA, so this is the stable unit treatment value assumption. Um, so basically this means that the treatment of one individual does not in turn change the potential outcomes of other individuals. And um, this is not always the case. Um, indeed, sometimes, especially if we're thinking of um, a market, you know, perhaps um, 
how other people are perceived and in turn the hiring decisions of other people might affect whether there's still places available for you to be um, hired for that same role. Um, there's also um, consistency. So there needs to be only one version of each treatment. Um, so this can also be limiting and say, you know, there might be, a, we might not only have gender discrimination as a binary. So perhaps there are different layers if someone is non-binary or if someone is trans. And so um, we would want to very explicitly model every relevant type of um, treatment. There's also positivity. So at each level of pretreatment variables, the probability of um, receiving any treatment must be strictly positive. Um, and then finally, we have conditional exchangeability. So we don't have any unobserved confounders that affect both the treatment assignment and the potential outcome um, once we condition on the pretreatment variables. And again, this, um, depending on the data you have available in this scenario can be quite a strong assumption. Um, so in terms of how we actually try to assess um, unfairness in this context, so of course this is quite easy if we actually had access to both potential outcomes, we could just very quickly um, calculate the difference for every individual and um, take an average and then we would have a nice estimate. But in practice, we only ever observe one potential outcome for each individual. So in terms of imputing the other potential outcome, um, the, there's many different methods that can be used. Um, in this case, what we do is we choose one of the groups as a baseline group. So in this case, perhaps the men are treated as a baseline, and then we train a model for the probability of being hired conditional on certain pretreatment attributes if you are treated the same way as um, the male individuals. And then we can apply this to the female individuals to impute um, how, what their hiring decision would have been if they were treated in the same way as the male individuals. Um, and so in this way, um, we can try to um, start answering that question of, um, but for an individual's gender, would they have been hired? And in this way, hopefully we can um, develop inference that also maps onto how people think about discrimination um, in the legal context. Um, so in our paper, we also go through and um, develop some causal equivalents of many of the common statistical fairness notions like parity, calibration, positive predictive parity, and equalized odds. Um, I won't have time today to run through all of these, um, but instead I'll illustrate this a little bit in, uh, um, in, a numerical in the numerical results we derived from um, a synthetic example using these sorts of metrics. So basically we synthesized some data here where we have um, several different sources of disparity that we want to distinguish between using causal versus statistical notions of fairness. Um, and in the synthetic um, hiring scenario, we have alpha, which is the level of disparity in the job qualifications between the two different genders. Um, for the sake of this toy example, we just have two groups um, in terms of gender. Um, and then we have beta, which is the level of disparity in the interview score for the level of job qualification. And so this is one form of bias. This is bias in the interview process. And then we have gamma, which is the level of discrimination in the job decision conditional on the job qualification and interview score. So this is um, yet another form of bias. This is the bias that occurs after um, the interview process. And we also consider in this two different starting points for the unfairness evaluation before the interview and after the interview in order to distinguish between beta and gamma. Um, and so these are the um, numerical results we get from these experiments. And so basically on the x-axis, we have beta, which is the discrimination in the interview score. And then on the y-axis, we have the fairness evaluation that we measure. And we have three different cases here for different levels of alpha. So this is a baseline where there is no difference in qualifications across gender. Um, and then these are where one of the genders have higher qualifications. 
Um, and first, um, I want to point out that, so for causal post, which is the green line, it's flat throughout, which makes sense because basically that's when we evaluate bias after the interview process. And since beta is bias in the interview process, um, that should be flat throughout. So it's flat, but non-zero because it's reflecting gamma, which is the bias outside of the interview process. Um, for causal pre and statistical, though, um, what we would ideally like to see is that um, the bias should increase with beta, since for those two metrics, we're trying to measure both the bias from beta and also from gamma, um, and the bias should be non-negative, ideally. Um, and so when we look at the scenario where there are no disparities in qualifications between the different genders, we see similar trends um, for causal pre and statistical. So we can't compare apples and apples, apples to apples, the actual um, the actual axes exactly. So you should um, so we don't need to worry too much about the exact slopes um, or the exact um, intersection with the y-axis, but we can see the trends are the same in terms of starting um, at um, a fairly low level of bias that's positive and then going up with beta. This changes, however, and the two types of metrics diverge when we have differing baselines between the different demographic groups. And so in the scenario where females have higher qualifications than males, in this case, the causal pre still has quite similar trends to what we saw um, before in that we have positive um, levels of fairness violation for all of these and it increases with beta. For the statistical notion, however, now the bias is measured as being negative because since the bias is against females, but in this scenario, females have higher qualifications, the fact that the statistical notion of fairness does not separate between these differing sources of bias um, leads to a very, different, um, a very different interpretation of whether the model is actually biased. Um, in contrast, if we have at baseline that the males have higher qualifications than the females, in this scenario, the statistical notion of fairness significantly overestimates um, the level of unfairness in comparison to the causal pre. Um, and so the major takeaways um, from this work are first that um, causal analysis at different points can help identify more precisely specific sources of disparities and distinguish between them. Um, Parity-based causal and statistical fairness notions converge when we don't have disparities in the baseline attributes. Um, but they do diverge when it comes to um, differing baselines. Um, and in those contexts, the statistical um, notions of fairness either over or underestimate the level of unfairness. Um, as a result, statistical fairness is not capable of distinguishing unfairness at each of these different time points. Um, and ultimately, our framework also underscores the need for um, data sets that span this decision-making pipeline. So um, in our synthetic example, we were able to very specifically distinguish um, what were pre-treatment variables versus post-treatment and separate out the interview score as well. Um, in practice, that can often be difficult to distinguish, um, especially when gender or whatever your sensitive attribute is, is perceived at various points in the decision-making process. And so having data that can help you delineate that can be quite critical for distinguishing whether the bias is due to one part of the process versus another part. Um, so that's the first paper. And I see there's um, a question in the chat. Oh, 10 minutes left. Yep. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> I will speed things up with the second presentation. Um, okay. So let me see. Yes, I'll go through this very quickly then. Um, so this is human centric visual diversity auditing. Um, this is joint work with Drone Andrews and Shemek Joniak, um, who are also um, on the Sony AI team. And Shemek was our intern over the summer. 
Um, so basically, um, some to set some context for this work. Um, so when we talk about um, fairness in the tabular data context, we're often worried about these discriminatory trends in our data. In the computer vision context, typically the primary problem driving unfairness is lack of diversity in our data sets. And this is just one example illustrating this. So on the left-hand side, we have the original image. In the middle, we have a downsampled image. And on the right-hand side, we um, have applied a model to reconstruct the face. And we can see that the right-hand images um, have ended up looking much more Caucasian and much more male in comparison to the left-hand images. And this is due to biases in the um, in the model that in the face restoration model, which has seen far more images of males and Caucasian individuals than of um, female or darker skinned individuals. And so um, even though diversity in human image data sets is a very critical concern for fairness, it's quite difficult in practice to actually achieve diversity. So the canonical way that people approach this at the moment is to discretize certain demographic categories. So usually people think of gender, race, and age. Um, and then to try to guarantee parity across these different groups. So equal number of images in each of these groups. Um, and this has a number of shortcomings. So first off, um, this does not necessarily capture all of the visual diversity we would be interested in. So for example, on the right-hand side, we see images that all fall under this Caucasian female 20 to 39 bucket, but it's a very homogenous um, looking set of images. So using these categories doesn't necessarily capture all the diversity we're interested in. And then in addition to that, oftentimes in research, people assume that we have access to labeled information about people's demographics. And this is typically not actually true in practice. And so often this involves um, relying on human annotators to create these labels. And of course that um, then in turn adds additional layers of bias also makes it quite difficult for people who might not um, fit very neatly within your demographic taxonomy to be seen. Um, so for example, if you discretize gender into just male and female, um, people who are non-binary will not um, be necessarily featured appropriately, or people who are multi-ethnic might not be captured um, with a simple race characterization. Um, so instead, what we do in this paper is we try to train a model to actually um, learn um, a facial embedding space of what dimensions people think are relevant for facial similarity. And then we use this model to be able to generate diversity scores for human image data sets. And so the um, intuition behind how we do this is so we have these triplets of human face images and we ask people to choose the odd one out. So of these three, which um, person looks the least similar to the other two. And by doing this, we are implicitly learning the different dimensions that people think are relevant for judging facial similarity. So for example, um, for the first um, triplet, you can imagine that maybe people would think the middle image is the odd one out because of a hair color difference versus in the second um, triplet, people might pick the third image um, due to differences in gender and age compared to the other two. And so, um, through all of these triplet um, judgments, we're able to identify these relevant dimensions. And so the basic idea is that um, our model is learning these face embeddings that hopefully should capture the various dimensions that people are implicitly using. And in this way, we're not requiring folks to explicitly label the images, but instead to reflect upon just visual similarity. Um, and in order to actually test whether the dimensions our model learns are actually Excuse meaningful. Me, Alice, there's oh, yeah. a question from the audience, do you mind? Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Sure. Hi Alice, um, in this uh, method that you have for gen uh, evaluating diversity, mm -hmm. it seems like it's circular because you need the diversity in the triplets that you are presenting. So if you don't have diversity, enough diversity in the triplets of images that you show, then you will never be able to uh, 
get diversity in the outcome. So it's somehow you, you are using as input the type of uh, outcome that you would like to get. I mean, it's, it, it looks a bit circular. So some diversity is required um, in the training data set for this, but one advantage of our approach is you can, the model can extrapolate beyond the diversity that it has seen um, and that it basically learns these dimensions that are relevant for diversity, but you could have, you know, scores of diversity that are higher than what was actually seen in the training data set. So any um, way of formally stating it? Um, in the in the paper, <laughs> we do, um, but um, but My yeah, I guess is if, if all triplets will be white people between the age of twenty and thirty, then you will never uh, figure out diversity with respect to older people or black people because they mm -hmm. haven't been shown in the triplets. Yeah, so you need every relevant type of feature to be represented um, in the data set, but you don't necessarily need the whole spectrum. So for example, if you have zero diversity at all in skin tone in the training set, then it of course cannot learn that skin tone is relevant. But if you have um, some degree of diversity, so let's say you have Fitzpatrick scale um, two to four, but you don't have one to six, it can still learn that skin tone is relevant and then you know, know that if you do later on have um, images that have a wider range of skin tone, that that is a more diverse set. Um, but, um, but yeah, you do need to have at least some degree of diversity um, in that dimension in the training set. Um, so, so yeah. Um, so just to quickly run through um, this part over here. So basically, um, so after we trained this model, our goal was to um, try to see whether these dimensions are meaningful or human interpretable. And so um, for each dimension, what we did was um, we arranged them in descending order. And then first we asked human participants to label these dimensions. So basically to have one to three labels of how they would characterize this dimension. Um, and then afterward, we um, created word clouds in terms of what sorts of um, labels people tend to ascribe to them. And so here you can see, um, you know, some, some of the categories that emerged did seem quite similar to what people often think of in terms of demographic categories. So you have like male, um, female, um, Black, Caucasian, East Asian, South Asian, and elderly. Um, but we also did find certain dimensions that were not what we typically see in a lot of um, you know, demographic labels. And so we have dimensions around people's facial shapes, people's facial expressions, facial hair, um, and also whether their hair was dyed or not. So there's also these other implicit um, dimensions of diversity that people are using for judging whether faces are similar that you know, might not be included otherwise if we're just labeling um, the dimensions via, via demographics. And the second approach we took was to, again, for each dimension, have, um, have images um, ordered in descending order, and then to introduce a novel image and ask human participants to place this novel image somewhere along um, the spectrum. And then to compare that to where our model would place it. Um, and we found that there was a pretty high correlation between where humans would place it versus where the model would place it, which um, further affirmed to us that there was something um, that our model was learning that it maps onto how humans would judge similarity and that these dimensions were capturing something that is human interpretable. Um, and then finally, the last thing we looked at here was, of course, one of the original motivations for this is we wanted to sidestep some issues of annotator bias that come with explicitly labeling demographics, but we were still worried um, about the extent to which there might be annotator bias. So we also checked for that here. And we did find that if we use the annotator specific mask and included that in our model, it did um, improve our model's performance. And so that does imply that there is information in the annotator specific mask. And this also does imply that different people see different dimensions as being of different levels of importance for judging facial similarity. 
Um, and then finally, we checked to see whether there were systematic differences here. And we did find that there were, were differences um, in terms of um, how people weighed different dimensions, depending on if they were male or female, um, European or Asian, and also depending on their age. Um, so this further affirms that it's quite important to have a very diverse set of annotators and also to be quite aware of potential annotator biases because there isn't necessarily you know, one way of determining whether um, different faces look more similar or different. So sorry for that very whirlwind <laughs> set of two presentations, but hopefully um, that um, hopefully that gave you a bit of a flavor for both of these papers and happy to answer any questions if we have time. Terrific. Um, thank you so much, Alice. I don't see questions in chat yet, and Ben is going to help us if there are questions in the room. We have a question here from Jordan. Hi, so I'm curious, in the end, does this allow you to do better on the task you showed us in the beginning, the downsample reconstruct task? If, for instance, you sort of uh, look at your data set and try to make it more equidistributed in this embedding that you find, do you do better on that task? Um, yeah, so that's one thing we, we still need to test out, but <laughs> yes, that's one thing we're working on. Uh, I have a question for you, Alice. I'm wondering the extent to which you could talk about some of the differences in annotator bias and how those might relate to research in the social sciences that look at kind of people's different ability to distinguish people who are outside of their, and I'm putting this in quotes, race, or racial group, ethnic group, et cetera, and whether or not you saw um, people focused on kind of more granular versus more, I don't know, nuanced differences among people or what sort of reflections you might have on that. Yeah, definitely. So that's basically some of what we're doing for the next phase of this work to get more of a qualitative sense of what are these differences in terms of how different groups might care about different features. Um, so I can't say yet in terms of, you know, what exactly our findings are there. Um, but I will say yeah, we are um, very interested in this in part because of all of that cognitive science literature that implies that that is the case. And also that, you know, people might see greater, um, might have a harder time distinguishing different people of different races compared to different people of their same race. And so um, if you don't have a sufficiently diverse set of annotators in this case, that might, for example, lead to a prioritization of characteristics that might distinguish, say, different Caucasian individuals if the annotator group was predominantly Caucasian. Um, so I think, you know, um, no precise answers yet on that front, but definitely um, an interesting area that's been opened up by this work. Any other questions in the room, Ben? I think, uh, no, I have a question, but I'll save it to the panel discussion. Okay, right um, now terrific. We, have... we are a few minutes behind, so I think we're gonna take a coffee break and are we gonna reconvene Ben and Zach at, in, at the half hour or in 24 I, minutes or what? I think 10.30 would be good. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Alice. Thank you. Thank you all.